Welcome, everybody. We're going to give uh, another minute or two for people to be admitted from the waiting room and to log on, but welcome. Happy Tuesday. All right. It's 501 here on the uh, left coast of California. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Crotty Alexander. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician at UCSD. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight, you tonight to the American Thoracic Society COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum. Um, we've been running these forums almost every Tuesday uh, from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, for several months uh, through the pandemic. And I'm excited that our topic tonight is on vaccine development and uh, what we know about immune responses in COVID-19. So today we have uh, two fantastic speakers. One is uh, Dr. Carolyn uh, Motterbacher, who is here. She's a postdoc in the Crotty Lab at the Institute of Allergy and Immunology here in La Jolla. And we also have uh, Dr. Sydney Ramirez, who is both a infectious uh, disease fellow and a postdoc in the Crotty Lab at LJI. We have uh, no relevant financial relationships or that should impact the presentations today. We are offering a CME for this session. So uh, these are our objectives and our accreditation information. And to claim the CME, all you have to do is fill out the evaluation of our session. And we'll be posting this link in the chat box uh, multiple times tonight as well. It's also an opportunity to give us feedback on these sessions and let us know what you'd like to uh, be presented on next to help you in your care of COVID-19 uh, patients. We have done many sessions uh, to date. These are all posted and openly available on the American Thoracic Society website. You can search for the ATS uh, COVID uh, forum and we come up top of the list in the Google searches. Uh, and we can also post this link in the chat box as well. We have three more uh, forums coming up this year, including uh, emboli and thrombosis, updates in airway management, and ECMO in COVID-19. We uh, form a big team to put these on. Uh, it's fun to work with everybody, but in particular, Dr. Narav Shah, Dr. Sushma Kribs, and Dr. Viren Kahl help me organize and run these sessions, along with our fearless team of residents and our amazing ATS staffers, Lauren Lynch and Liz Guzman in particular. So with that, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce and pass the mic over to Dr. Motterbacher. Uh, and just to let you know, she graduated from the University of Cincinnati and attended graduate school at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. So thank you so much for joining us tonight to teach us a little bit about uh, immunity in COVID-19. Great, uh, thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you uh, to everyone for putting this session on. It's um, great to get to um, join you all tonight and to talk a bit about um, our work in the Crowdy Lab here at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. And so um, today I'm going to uh, discuss our recent work or some of our recent work from the lab that has focused on uh, understanding antigen specific adaptive immunity to SARS-CoV-2 in acute COVID-19 and some of the associations that we identify uh, with age and disease severity. So where we as a lab really started at the beginning of this pandemic with our research on COVID-19 was a collaborative project with another lab here at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, uh, trying to understand what the T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2 looked like in recovered COVID-19 patients. And what this paper that came out back in May now, um, which feels like five years ago instead of just a few months ago at the rate of COVID-19 
protein research. Um, but this paper uh, was really the benchmark and the first paper to measure antigen specific CD4 and CD8 T cell responses to COVID-19. And in fact, what they found is that almost all individuals um, possessed antigen specific CD4 T cells and a sizable fraction also had measurable CD8 T cell responses specific for SARS-CoV-2 after recovering from COVID-19 disease. Uh, in addition, this paper also identified that a decent fraction of unexposed individuals actually possessed common cold or actually possessed cross-reactive uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells. And it was thought that um, these SARS-CoV-2 cross-reactive T cells are actually developed um, when individuals encounter uh, commonly circulating common cold-causing coronaviruses. Um, and there's still ongoing work to understand what role these uh, cross-reactive T cells might play for infection and uh, vaccine outcomes. So with this first paper really highlighting that we can measure and identify antigen specific uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells in recovered patients, we wanted to follow that up and address hopefully some of these continuing knowledge gaps in understanding immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And so some of the major gaps at the time and even continuing now is really trying to understand how much of an adaptive immune response is there to COVID-19. So there's sort of uh, two trains of thought on this where there might be an idea that an overzealous adaptive immune response could actually cause uh, immunopathology and uh, contribute to severe COVID-19 disease. But on the other hand, um, there's some hypotheses that severe COVID-19 is actually due to a poor or absent adaptive immune response. Additionally, what kind of immunity is really important against COVID-19? And so a lot of the current vaccine trials are really focusing, and rightfully so, on the development of antigen-specific neutralizing antibodies. But um, what role, if any, might antigen-specific CD4 and CD8 T cells play um, in the context of infection or as we get down the line in our research in vaccine development? Additionally, um, we were interested in trying to understand why some people get severely ill and other people have relatively mild disease. So there's really um, this broad spectrum of disease presentation with COVID-19 and trying to understand whether there might be some aspect to the adaptive immune response uh, that can predict whether individuals will develop severe disease or not. And so um, with these ideas in mind, our major goal of this project was to really assess all three arms of adaptive immunity across a wide range of disease severity to better understand SARS-CoV-2 protective immunity. And in order to do this, we enrolled 54 subjects, 24 of which were acute COVID-19 cases that um, represented a wide variety of disease severity states. Uh, we also had 15 convalescent donors and 15 unexposed. Um, within this study, we wanted to look uh, in detail at the antigen specific adaptive immune response across all three of its branches. So we wanted to measure uh, antigen specific antibodies, including neutralizing antibodies, as well as antigen specific CD4 and CD8 T cells. So in addition to looking at all of the adaptive immune responses, uh, we employed a high parameter immunophenotyping panel uh, to assess general immune cell populations that might be um, tracking alongside our antigen specific adaptive immune cell populations. So with this in mind, the first thing we set out to do was to really measure um, or to establish what the antigen specific adaptive immune response looked like in our acute cohort. And this is really at the time um, and is still one of the first papers to assess uh, antigen specific adaptive immunity across all three branches um, in acute patients. And so this was really a first look at all of these um, arms of the adaptive response at one time and in one cohort. And so 
looking at our acute patients. And so here I want to um, just take a moment to say that um, for all of the slides that I'll present today, our unexposed donors will be in gray, our acute cohort will be red dots and our convalescent donors will be in black. Um, and so what I hope you can appreciate for our antibody profiling is that uh, when we're looking at the receptor binding domain specific IgG and IgA, as well as IgM, which I'm not showing on this slide, um, but both acute and convalescent convalescent donors, almost all of them mount measurable titers uh, to RBD, as well as to SARS-CoV-2 spike. Additionally, using a pseudovirus neutralizing assay, we are able to measure neutralizing titers in almost all of our acute and convalescent donors. And as a brief aside, uh, we show that uh, the neutralizing titer assay strongly correlates with our RBD, IgG, and IgA titers in our cohorts, which um, tracks logically with the idea that most of these neutralizing antibodies are directed against the receptor binding domain. And so really, based on serological and uh, antibody measurements, almost all of our acute and all of our convalescent donors are mounting fairly comparable and measurable uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies and neutralizing antibodies as well. So shifting next into profiling what the acute SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 response looked like, we employed an activation induced marker or AIM assay uh, to measure in a highly sensitive manner antigen specific T cell responses in a way that was also cytokine independent. So essentially this assay takes PBMCs from unexposed, acutely infected or convalescent individuals and incubates their PBMCs with uh, different different SARS-CoV-2 specific peptide megapools. So this MPR refers to a peptide megapool that comprises um, all of the SARS-CoV-2 proteome minus spike epitopes. We also have a spike specific peptide megapool, a membrane specific and a nucleocapsid specific peptide megapool. And so what you can appreciate is that um, relative to our DMSO only negative controls um, and our unexposed donors, both the acute and and convalescent donors are able to mount uh, robust antigen-specific T-cell responses as measured by surface expression of OX40 and CD40 ligand by flow cytometry. And so this is a representation of what the staining looks like for these antigen-specific cells. Here is our quantification of each of the individual peptide megapools. And then additionally, we combine the uh, AIM response for each of the peptide megapools into a um, total AIM response for our CD4 T cells. And so this over here is what we're looking at. And again, uh, in our cohort, all of our convalescent donors mount uh, measurable responses uh, to SARS-CoV-2 in terms of CD4 T cells. Um, however, to note in, in sort of in breaking from the antibody response where everyone was pretty much making detectable antibodies and even neutralizing antibodies, um, within our antigen specific CD4 compartment, we really have sort of this bimodal distribution where about half the donors mounted robust AIM CD4 responses, but the other half sort of had this weak or minimal response that wasn't getting much higher than our unexposed controls, um, or even we're at our limit of detection here. And so, not all of our acute donors were mounting antigen specific CD4 responses. Now, when we looked within the CD4 uh, responders where the donors that were giving us uh, antigen specific CD4 T cells at their functionality by a uh, combination of either uh, measuring cytokines secreted into the supernatant after peptide stimulation or by intracellular cytokine staining, we found that interferon gamma and IL-2 were the dominant cytokines produced by our antigen specific cells, um, suggesting that we were in fact getting a sort of classical T H1 antiviral polarized CD4 T cell response. Additionally, looking at TH2 signature cytokines such as IL-5 or IL-13 or TH17 cytokines, we saw very minimal levels of those in both cohorts, um, furthering the idea that, um, again, when we do see an antigen-specific CD4 T cell response, it appears to be sort of that classic TH1 response um, that many people would hope to see uh, following COVID.
the disease onset. Uh, additionally, we measured SARS-CoV-2 specific circulating follicular helper T cells. And so these uh, follicular helper T cells are crucial for supporting class switched antibody responses, particularly neutralizing antibody responses. And so um, they really are important for uh, the, the proper humoral response. And if we look here at just some representative flow cytometry staining, the black dots here represent our total CD4 population. Um, we're looking at CXCR5 versus PD1 um, and dating on total CXCR5 positive CD4. So these are our uh, circulating TFH cells. And overlaid on that in blue are antigen specific CD4 T cells by AIM assay. And so you can appreciate that in both convalescent and acute donors, there are um, blue dots that are CXCR5 positive um, or circulating TFH cells for which we quantify here. So in terms of our CD4 compartment, not all of our acute donors were mounting measurable responses, but the ones that did seem to have largely TH1 skewed um, antiviral CD4s, as well as a subset or a fraction of these circulating TFH cells that presumably would be helpful for B cell responses. Uh, moving on to the specific uh, CD8 T cell responses, we again employed the activation induced marker assay here using two different markers that uh, we've demonstrated to be uh, more specific for the CD8 compartment. Um, and again, both acute and convalescent donors are able to respond to our different peptide megapool conditions. However, similarly to our CD4 responders, our acute donors sort of have this separate grouping um, where we have this low minimal to no re detectable response in our CD8 T cell compartment. However, in individuals who uh, had measurable antigen specific CD8 T cells, those T cells also appeared to uh, largely produce interferon gamma um, as well as granzyme B. Additionally, the interferon gamma positive CD8s had TNF alpha, and all of these sort of seemed comparable to um, positive control CMV positive cells represented by the teal or blue dots. And so, um, again, Similar to the CD4s, not all of the acute donors mounted measurable CD8 responses, but those that do seem to have an appropriate skewing in the CD8 compartment as well. And so with this data, we demonstrated that we could measure these antigen specific responses, at least in a subset of our donors. And so we wanted to take this further and then ask, okay, well, is there something about the magnitude, the combination, or the presence or absence of these different branches of the adaptive response that might might be predictive of disease outcome. And so we next looked at each of these three branches of adaptive immunity, antibody, CD4, and CD8 T cells individually and asked whether the differential levels of these uh, adaptive arms were associated with uh, more severe or less severe disease. And so Perhaps a bit surprisingly, uh, in our cohort, when we looked at uh, levels of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies, uh, considering a high level to be greater than 100 based on our assay, we found no significant association uh, between disease severity. So donors with high levels of neutralizing antibodies in our cohort were just as likely to exhibit severe or mild disease. However, when we looked at the CD4s, we found that donors that had a high number of SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 antigen specific CD4 T cells had an increased likelihood of experiencing mild disease. And the same is true for our CD8 T cells as well. So this together suggests perhaps that uh, the T cell response is playing some role in uh, effectively protecting or um, contributing to disease uh, trajectory in these individuals. And so looking at each of these individually, we next um, wanted to assess them together in multiple different ways. And so the first way we assessed the sort of coordination or potential coordination between these adaptive immune branches was by um, giving all of our donors in our cohort an adaptive immunity score. So 
which we term ADAM. So in the ADAM scoring system, donors are given one point up to a maximum of three for the presence of um, these high levels of neutralizing antibodies, um, CD4 T cells or antigen specific CD8 T cells. So a maximum score of three. And what we found with the scoring system is that if donors had any two or all three of these uh, adaptive immune arms, that they were significantly more likely to experience mild disease relative to donors who had uh, no measurable adaptive immune response or had only engaged one arm of the adaptive immune response. And as a quick um, little piece of data for one donor to illustrate this point, uh, we actually had a donor that was negative for neutralizing antibodies, however, um, had a robust antigen specific CD4 response, as well as a CD8 T cell response. And this donor actually had relatively mild disease and recovered quite well. And so this is one example, perhaps, of um, an individual lacking antibodies, um, but having a, a strong T cell response that seemingly could compensate uh, for that. So this was sort of our simplistic view of trying to understand how antigen specific adaptive immunity might interact um, and protect or predict disease severity. Um, and our next metric was to actually perform a much more um, detailed analysis by um, compiling data for all donors across 111 different disease parameters. So these disease parameters constituted or uh, com were composed of antigen specific CD4, CD8 antibody metrics, as well as functional data like cytokine secretion. Additionally, we included data such as NK cells, B cell frequencies, uh, naive T cell frequencies that we gathered from our immunophenotyping panel. And we also included uh, some clinical information from our donors, including days post-symptom onset, age, peak disease severity, um, and comorbidities. And so with all of these parameters assembled, we performed pairwise Spearman correlations. Um, and so after the correlations were performed, uh, we also had an unsupervised hierarchical clustering algorithm that generated these correlograms and allowed us to see sort of these correlation blocks that existed within our data. And so what you're looking at here is a correlogram of all of these Spearman correlations uh, for our entire acute COVID-19 donor cohort. And on this correlogram, the darker the blue uh, color corresponds to the stronger the positive correlation. The darker red is the stronger negative correlation. Um, and while it might be difficult to see on this screen, um, each of these blocks also has asterisk in it, which denotes the respective p-value for that given uh, pairwise uh, correlation. And so this gives us really an, a, a way to look at relationships from sort of a bird's eye view and see where some of these larger patterns in adaptive immune responses might, um, might start to exist. And so what I want to first point out is that we see these big um, positive correlation blocks that form within each of the individual adaptive immune branches. So we have our CD4 T cell block right here. We have our antibody block in green, and then we also have our smaller CD8 T cell block in orange. But not only do we see positive correlations between um, or within adaptive immune branches, but we also see coordination or correlation blocks forming within adaptive branches. So we see positive correlations with antigen specific CD4 responses and antigen specific antibodies, as well as CD4 and CD8 T cells. And even to a lesser extent, some correlations between antigen specific CD8s and antibodies. And so um, what we're really trying to um, to get from this data set is that it looks like there is some coordination happening between these different adaptive immune branches. And so looking at all of our acute COVID-19 cases, we wanted to sort of split it up into um, 
what we know might be some interesting um, subgroups within our total cohort. And so the first one we really wanted to look at was age because it's known that age is a major COVID-19 risk factor. And so what we did um, with our acute cohort was to stratify and rerun our correlation analyses um, for donors younger than 65 years old and those greater than or equal to 65 years of age. And so looking at the correlogram on the left at the donors younger than 65, um, hopefully you can appreciate that many of these um, correlation blocks still exist um, in this cohort and particularly the within or between group uh, coordination blocks or correlation blocks still exist. However, um, strikingly, when we get into our older cohort, we start to see the within group associations break down. And more importantly, we see this breakdown um, or suggesting a greater uh, uncoordination between our CD4 and antibody responses, our T cell compartments, um, and our CD8s and antibodies. And so it seems like um, age, one effect that age might be having on responses to COVID-19 is sort of this uncoordinated antigen-specific adaptive immune response. And so we wanted to dive a bit deeper and ask, are there specific parameters or what is it about age that might actually be causal in this poor adaptive immune response? And so we constructed um, or pulled out some of the strongest associations within our entire acute COVID-19 cohort into this micro correlogram here. Um, and some of the ones that really stuck out to us were uh, naive CD4 and CD8 T cells being significantly negatively associated with both age and peak disease. And what we found when we looked uh, specifically at naive CD4 and naive CD8 T cell frequencies over um, age is that there was a significant decline in all of our cohorts, um, most strikingly in our naive CD8 T cell compartment. And this is something that has been demonstrated and known previously in the aging literature that the naive T cell compartments um, tend to decline with age. And um, we again saw that in our cohort as well. Um, multivariate analysis on this data, um, essentially looking at the slopes of these lines for these three cohorts showed no significant difference. So we really feel as though the effect that we're seeing in the naive T cell frequencies truly is a function of age and not merely disease status. Um, so Older individuals in our cohort, across all of our cohorts, have fewer naive CD4 and CD8 T cells. And what this means for disease severity is uh, quite interesting. In fact, if we look at our naive CD4 T cells, there's a significant negative correlation looking at the red statistics and the red dots in our acute cohort. So uh, fewer naive CD4 T cells is uh, associated with worse disease outcome. Now this association sort of breaks down when we add in our convalescent donors denoted by the blue statistics here. Um, and so that suggests perhaps that there is some disease driven effect on the naive CD4 T cell compartments. Um, but that is also something that could potentially be limited by our cohort size. However, our naive CD8 T cell frequency um, remains strong in both our acute and our uh, total disease acute plus convalescent cohort. So here individuals with fewer naive CD8 T cells uh, were more likely to experience more severe COVID-19 disease. So really it seems like uh, aging is associated with a paucity of naive T cells and fewer naive T cells is associated with worse disease outcome in our cohort. And in keeping with that idea, we had a lot of um, correlations that came out of our analyses to suggest that a strong T cell response specific for SARS-CoV-2 really was associated with lower COVID-19 disease severity. Uh, particularly within just our acute cohort, we have um, a strong negative association with interferon gamma positive CD8s and disease severity. So if you have more gamma positive CD8s, you're more likely to experience less severe disease. Additionally, uh, individuals with more SARS-CoV-2 specific CD8s, uh, antigen specific CD4s, as well as antigen specific circulating TFH cells 
all had an increased likelihood of having less severe disease, suggesting a protective role for uh, antigen-specific T-cell responses in disease severity. Additionally, when we look sort of within our CD4 T-cell compartment and do a little bit more detailed phenotyping analysis at some chemokine receptor expression, we found that antigen-specific CXCR3 negative, CCR6 positive, CD4, as well as circulating TFH cells um, were negatively associated with disease severity. And so this subset expression, CXCR3 negative, CCR6 positive, um, is often associated with a TH17 like T cell skewing. However, we did not detect uh, much IL-17 at all being produced. And so we would actually posit that in this context, the CCR6 expression might actually be serving as sort of a lung homing uh, function on these cells. And so that sort of goes with the thinking that if you have more antigen specific cells able to home to the lung, uh, you are uh, more likely to experience less severe disease. Um, and then the final association I wanted to point out was the idea or was the association with some inflammatory cytokines and um, adaptive immune responses. And, and this is not new. There is uh, much data out there suggesting that IL-6, IL-8, and CXCL-10 all sort of uh, are predictive of uh, worse disease outcome with higher levels of these inflammatory cytokines. And similarly, we also saw that in our cohort, but what was interesting is that we actually saw this negative association specifically with our CD4 T cell block and our CD8 block, but not with our antigen specific antibody block. And so moving forward, it would be interesting to investigate uh, CXCL10 as a biomarker of not only sort of poor overall outcome uh, or more severe disease, but as a biomarker of poor CD4 and CD8 T cell responses specifically. So that's something that would be quite interesting to flush out in a uh, more robust uh, sample size in the future. So um, to summarize what I've shown today, T cell and antibody responses in average cases of COVID-19 look like protective immune responses and largely match antiviral immune response expectations. So donors that mounted CD4 and CD8 T cell responses had T cells that looked like they could um, effectively handle or, or respond to a viral infection, um, but not all donors mounted antigen specific T cell responses. And that coordinated adaptive immunity uh, is associated with protective immunity. And that's really the major point that um, our study is trying to highlight is that um, it's not necessarily a matter of which arm of the adaptive response you engage, but if you're able to engage a breath um, or multiple arms of the adaptive immune response, uh, that tended to uh, associate with less severe disease and, and make you more protected than individuals who mounted none or just a single arm of adaptive immunity. And additionally, uh, we also observed no convincing evidence of causal negative associations of adaptive immunity with disease severity. So it really didn't seem in any of our donors that we assessed that immunopathology or an overactive adaptive immune response was really um, associated with disease severity or even happening in our donors. Um, it, anything, it seemed like uh, donors were failing to mount uh, measurable or robust enough antibody or antigen specific responses. Additionally, um, while it's known that age is a major COVID-19 risk factor, um, we wanted to sort of fill in what factors associated with age might be contributing to um, this problem with COVID-19. And one of that um, is this idea of a poorly coordinated antibody and T cell response, which we saw break down when we stratified donors over the age of 65. Additionally, um, the idea that this limited naive T cell repertoire was associated with worse disease outcome, which is really sort of intuitive if you consider that elderly individuals who are seeing a brand new virus for the first time and also have a very limited or small 
naive T cell repertoire will not be able to respond um, perhaps rapidly enough or to um, a sufficient magnitude to effectively handle the disease. And um, therefore that's why we see one of the reasons contributing to worse disease outcome in these individuals. And now I know that this is um, sort of directed um, based on the title of the forum towards uh, vaccine design, I don't really wanna get into the weeds too much on it, but I just sort of have one slide with a few sort of thought questions for what this body of work um, might potentially imply as we consider um, moving a lot of the focus of our research into COVID-19 vaccine design. And so one question is sort of, what is the ideal vaccine? Um, is it something that elicits neutralizing antibodies alone, or is it a vaccine that's gonna elicit neutralizing antibodies and some sort of combination of T cells? And so we're really trying to um, sell the idea that T, that T cells are really great at handling this virus. And, and in the context of a vaccine, um, or in the context of actual infection, that is, um, of course, um, fairly evident, but in a vaccine setting, I still think um, perhaps a vaccine that can elicit a strong neutralizing antibody response um, would really be a good first line of defense against uh, preventing infection. But additionally, if a vaccine is also able to induce a T cell response, then you sort of have a second line of defense um, if the neutralizing antibodies uh, or the protection afforded by the neutralizing antibodies is sort of just subpar, um, a T cell response or a vaccine engendering T cells um, would potentially help counteract that deficiency. Additionally, I mentioned on the intro slide, the idea of these pre-existing cross-reactive T cells that have been identified. And it's really interesting to think about and and see what role these pre-existing cross-reactive T cells might play in uh, the adaptive response to infection and or in a vaccine setting. And so there's a couple hypotheses that have yet to really be tested uh, in this field, but one of those is that these pre-existing T cells might be protective. They might um, sort of be uh, a memory population that could be rapidly recalled following infection or vaccination and expand and protect the individual, or they might actually be uh, in some ways detrimental and um, in some ways maybe they are targeting uh, epitopes that are uh, not going to be crucial for controlling SARS-CoV-2 infection, or they might be potentially skewed towards, say, a Th2 biased response, which could also um, then skew a vaccine response towards something that may not be uh, extremely protective. And so these are interesting ideas surrounding these cross-reactive T cells and are something that's going to need to be investigated, particularly in the context um, of some of these vaccines that are going through the pipeline. Um, and then additionally, there's really a whole um, still as yet unexplored uh, interplay between innate and adaptive immune responses, both in infection and moving forward in these vaccines. Um, and it's something that we unfortunately really didn't have the power to investigate in much detail in this study, but it would be very interesting to follow up um, and measure innate responses um, in sort of a longitudinal setting where we could see if um, overzealous or um, maladaptive innate responses might somehow contribute to a um, defective or suboptimal adaptive immune response as well. And are there ways that might need to be overcome in the context of vaccination? And a final point along that line, since we spent some time talking about elderly or more elderly individuals doing worse with COVID-19 disease, it's also known that the aging immune system sort of has one hand tied behind its back in some senses, um, because not only do you have sort of immunosenescence that happens in the adaptive immune system for B cells and T cells, but often there's sort of this low level sterile inflammation termed inflammaging that exists in elderly individuals. And so those are some additional things that that sort of um, make studying 
immune responses to COVID-19 in elderly individuals more difficult, um, but also of more importance. And so moving into vaccine design, understanding different adjuvants, um, vaccine platforms, or perhaps uh, administration schedules or routes of administration might become more important um, as we look at our elderly cohorts uh, because their immune systems, both innate and adaptive, are sort of starting off on a much different foot than a, a healthy younger adult. So I'd welcome if we want to go back and discuss some of these ideas or more. Um, but for now, I'm just going to stop and acknowledge everyone in both the Karate Lab uh, who helped with this, as well as uh, our collaborators at the Institute, the Sede Lab, Sapphire Lab, and the Peters Lab, uh, the core institutes here, as well as our external collaborators who provided um, a lot of samples and uh, experimental expertise. And so um, with that, I guess, if there are questions or I can um, hand yeah. over the stage. That was amazing. You've already gotten multiple thank yous in the chat box. So thank you for speaking so clearly about a very complicated topic. Um, I'm going to lead off with uh, one question about, is there been any thought as to, is there a method by which you could boost the naive CD8 T cell numbers in older adults? Um, so I think, I don't know if anyone has tried that. I don't believe anyone has tried that, but there's also sort of, um, there's also, you know, like thymic involution and, um, sort of the, and, and the bone marrow starts to become less productive with age. So, um, it's not just the cells themselves. It's sort of like the, the tissues producing them. And so I think that it's, um, not something that would be easy and I'm not aware of it happening. I know that there is perhaps like some interest in some of these senescent cells. So these, you know, memory cells that may sort of be um, hypo responsive. Is there a way to sort of bring them back to life? But in terms of the naive T cell compartment, um, I don't know if that's something that could really be, be boosted. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Michael Lamb had a specific questions about what happens when the three arms of the adaptive immune system don't coordinate with each other in a way that they should? Do you think that that leads to poor viral clearance, that that might lead to the uncontrolled innate immune responses resulting in severe ARDS? Like what is the bad part about three, the three arms not communicating? Yeah, so... Um... There's still, there's still a lot of work that needs to be really flushed out into understanding what is it about the coordination between the branches that um, is really conferring um, protection against more severe disease. Um, and that's something that we'd be interested in looking at in um, a longitudinal study and some where we can track individuals. Ideally, it would be great if we could get individuals prior to infection, find individual, and then, and then get samples from them at the early stages where really the innate immune system is running the show. And then um, also follow them through the development of the adaptive response uh, to convalescence and even into the memory phase. And so um, those are things that um, are really of interest, but for this initial study, we were sort of underpowered. There were a lot of confounding factors um, that made it difficult to really assess specific um, individual things within the branches. Um, but we would love to pursue that first. <laughs> well, I think you're gonna get your chance. As we mentioned in the chat box, the uh, COVID infection rates are increasing. And so I think you're going to be able to recruit both the critically ill and the early infected population uh, that you need um, to continue. We had another question from Dr. Howell, um, who is asking, you know, and I think I'm going to change the question a little bit, but, you know, there is some data showing that dexamethasone, you know, so systemic steroids has an impact on uh, development of the severe forms of COVID-19 might be a little bit protective. So what do you think the role is for dexamethasone on the adaptive immune response in COVID? Um, yeah, so I think that in general, it's thought that it could be um, sort of 
detrimental to a, a normal adaptive immune response, but in contexts where an individual is sort of predisposed, be it by a over uh, exuberant or uh, miscued innate response to producing a um, equally um, large and potentially dangerous adaptive response that it could potentially be protective. But um, I don't think that currently there are enough studies to um, really get at exactly what it means for this phenotype of sort of the coordination between the different branches of the adaptive response. But it was interesting as it continues to be used to think about Excellent answer, because I didn't think there was an actual answer. So <laughs> thank you for uh, trying to put that in context. Um, I'm going to pass the mic now to Dr. Sydney Ramirez, who you know obtained her PhD in molecular RNA virology with her dissert dissertation in coronaviruses, uh, including vaccine development. Um, so we're so glad to have her here at UCSD and the La Jolla Institute of Allergy and Immunology doing her postdoc research uh, in this field. So Dr. Ramirez, if you wanna take it away. Thank you very much for having us here today. And it's a pleasure to talk to you all. So uh, I'm an MD PhD as was pointed out and was actually on service on the infectious disease consult service for much of the time that this research was being performed. And today I just wanted to give you an overview of a couple of the cases from the case series. I had the pleasure of enrolling all of the acute donors who uh, participated in this particular study. And uh, we tried really hard to try and make things less uh, confounding. But as you all know, you know, medicine is a challenging thing. Working with human subjects is a challenging thing. And so um, many, many good questions came up in the chat box and we tried to address them as much as possible with this study. But um, obviously there's always more work to be done. And um, as we learn more, we'll continue to become more sophisticated in our approach to COVID-19 care as well as research. So I'll just jump right in, starting with one of our critical disease cases. So this particular gentleman was 53 years old, um, had a past history of poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, uh, GERD and gout. Um, he was actually a physician who was working not at our hospital, but at a different hospital in a distant part of the state and uh, told me that he was exposed intubating a COVID-19 patient. Uh, he wore PPE. I didn't pry and ask exactly what PPE, uh, but asked me if I thought that that was his exposure when he came down with symptoms about three, four days after intubating this individual. Uh, he reported dyspnea, cough, fever. He had a change in his taste as well as some diarrhea. Um, I said dyspnea twice because apparently it was that important. Um, no, but he had his symptoms for about a week uh, by the time that I met him and enrolled him in our study. Uh, interestingly, he had been tested for COVID at an outside facility about five days prior and had tested negative. Uh, but by the time he presented to UCSD, he tested positive for COVID-19 via PCR-based testing. Uh, he had acute onset hypoxia that day of admission. He said that he had a pulse ox at home. He was checking his own oxygen levels. By the time he came to the hospital, he required four liters per minute via nasal cannula. And uh, he and I had a lovely discussion about what particular treatments I might recommend for someone in his situation. And at the time, our toolbox was incredibly limited. This was um, mid-May. And we had just had the New England Journal of Medicine study published about remdesivir and its potential role. And we had a discussion and I told him, you should really reach out to your hospitalist. You might benefit from this considering you're on oxygen and you really seem to fit um, the profile of people who benefited from remdesivir. And so he was actually started on emergency use authorization remdesivir on hospital day three, about two days after I met him and ultimately received a five day course of remdesivir. Uh, I'm sure there are many pulmonologists in the audience. I will not pretend to be one. This is his initial chest x-ray at the time of admission. It's not nearly as remarkable as what we'll see on his later chest x-ray findings, but we see some bilateral interstitial infiltrates. And we had this lovely algorithm designed by one of the radiology residents who's also an MD PhD at UCSD. And we can see that you know, it gives us a relatively high probability of you know, fitting the findings that might be present in COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, 
so unfortunately, um, this gentleman didn't do as well as I had hoped. And so right after starting remdesivir, essentially, he was transferred to the ICU the same day, uh, placed on a non-rebreather, and he was initially there for observation. But by the next day was intubated for hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, it, there was a little bit of variability in how um, critical care was approached for COVID-19 at the time. This particular individual was not paralyzed. He wasn't prone at any point during his ICU stay. Um, I'm an infectious disease specialist, and so I'm always interested in other infections. Uh, he actually had respiratory cultures on hospital days six and seven that had a, a heavy amount of MSSA that grew in the cultures. And I won't comment on the antibiotic choice since I wasn't consulting on the case, but he ultimately received about three days of IV vancomycin, Piperacil and Tazobactam, which is otherwise known as Zosin. Um, and for, I'm not entirely sure what reason, ultimately got another six days of ceftriaxone after that. Um, I will say that that is not the drug of choice for MSSA. Uh, as I mentioned, he was not a well-controlled diabetic. His A1C on admission was 9.4%. This is in the absence of receiving any steroids or anything that would you know, complicate this A1C. He had a mild transaminitis throughout most of his hospital stay, both the AST and ALT were mildly elevated. Um, slight increase in the setting of remdesivir, but nothing worrisome. And it returned to normal prior to discharge. He had normal renal function throughout his stay, uh, overall normal CBC with differential, um, had a mild leukocytosis for a brief period of time, which may have coincided with the MSSA that he grew in his sputum cultures. And this is one of his um, ICU chest x-rays just prior to extubation, actually. And so we can see that he really did progress uh, radiologically, radiographically, as well as clinically. And... Um, I'll say diffuse alveolar damage, <laughs> but again, I'm not a pulmonologist and I, I won't claim to be one. So he was extubated on hospital day 12. He was actually able to be extubated and transitioned to a low level of oxygen on um, via nasal cannula. And by hospital day 21 was on room air and discharged the next day. I actually got the pleasure of reconsenting him for our study two weeks post discharge because he had a little bit of um, memory loss from his ICU stay and he couldn't remember um, much of what had happened during his hospital stay and he wanted to be reinformed about the study. So one of the infectious disease doctors who saw him in our telemedicine COVID clinic saw him for follow-up and then reached out to me and said, can you please talk to him again about the study? And he um, agreed to continue to participate in our studies, which was great. And then I looked at his chart in preparation for this, and he's walking five miles per day on average at this point, not having any residual symptoms, really doing quite well. So this is you know, a case where we had someone do well, and you know, we've talked about the immune responses that we see, and I think that this is a good way to um, sort of tie what Dr. Motorbacher said into um, a clinical case. And so this particular individual is the red line here, so C82, A, B, and C being um, different time points that we were able to collect blood uh, from this individual. And we can see at the beginning, at the first time point, really not uh, much to talk about in the way of neutralizing antibody titers. But then, you know, his titers really shot up by the time we got that second time point around two weeks, and they stayed, you know, nice and stably high um, until close to the time of discharge. And Interestingly, we don't show it here. He's one of those people who had the fully coordinated adaptive immune response. So this is a really good illustration of what we can see um, happen when you have a fully coordinated adaptive immune response. So he had the CD4 helper T cell as well as the CD8 cytotoxic or killer T cell responses um, also detectable at these later time points. And so you know, just to illustrate an outcome where we have a partial or uncoordinated immune response that you know coincides with a poor outcome. Uh, another individual around the same time period, so again in May, admitted to one of our other ICUs um, will be presented now. So this is an 84 year old gentleman, not much past medical history that was known, hypothyroidism on levothyroxine, a herniated disc, it didn't specify which, I'm assuming lumbar, um, and then there was this questionable interstitial lung disease. Basically, the radiologist said that there were chronic interstitial changes on the chest x-ray, but this individual didn't have a prior history of any pulmonary disease, was not on oxygen at baseline, 
I spoke to his daughter in order to get consent for the study. Um, he lived in Mexico and was very active at baseline, apparently read the newspaper every day, was very engaged in uh, reading about science and, you know, would have, you know, loved to have consented to participate in the study had he not been intubated and um, very active individual, both mentally and physically. Uh, he didn't have a known exposure history. His daughter told me that he had been staying at home since the start of the pandemic, knowing that he was older and at higher risk for bad outcomes. And so it's unfortunate that he somehow was exposed. And he initially presented with malaise and dyspnea for about three days. So again, he lived in Mexico. So his first presentation was to a clinic in Mexicali. And then he was transferred from that clinic to El Centro Regional Medical Center, which is in Imperial County, uh, a few hours to the east of San Diego. And they did not have any ICU beds available at that time. And so he was transferred to UCSD for higher level of care. At the time that he was transferred to UCSD, he was only on high flow nasal cannula. He was at 15 liters per minute initially. And he was started on multiple antibiotics, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin for possible community acquired pneumonia. Uh, and then that was uh, escalated very quickly upon admission to vancomycin and again, piperacil and tazobactam, otherwise known as zosin, and azithromycin. This was his chest x-ray on admission. And again, the algorithm that our radiologists have designed, you know, suggests that he has bilateral, uh, very bright, <laughs> lit up uh, infiltrates that are consistent with COVID-19 pneumonia. So he came in on high flow nasal cannula, but was admitted to the IC for observation and shortly thereafter had to be intubated for hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, he was actually put, put on paralytics and proned throughout his hospital stay um, without much improvement at all in his respiratory status. Uh, they also trialed inhaled nitrous oxide um, without any significant improvement noted by the ICU team. This individual also received um, emergency use authorization remdesivir that was started on hospital day seven and ultimately only got a four-day course because of renal failure. Uh, he had a respiratory culture from hospital day eight that grew enterobacter erogenes, so was actually escalated from his prior antibiotic regimen to carbapenems for ventilator associated pneumonia. So the entire hospital stay, he was known to have leukocytosis with an elevated absolute neutrophil count. Um, speculatively, this might also have been related to you know, his bacterial pneumonia at some point. Uh, he had an intermittently low lymphocyte count. It was mildly low. This wasn't consistent in his CDCs. So I'm not sure if this is really a true finding uh, he also had mild transaminitis early in the admission that resolved on its own, uh, noted to have a number of inflammatory markers that were elevated. His D-dimer was very elevated, as was his fibrinogen, CRP, and his procalcitonin, which again might fit with the fact that he had an underlying bacterial process as well. Um, from the infectious disease perspective, he had very rare strep pneumoniae and strep agalactiae detected in his respiratory penile. And I say rare in the sense that the counts on the PCR were about 10 to the fourth. So not necessarily consistent with a true bacterial pneumonia. It's hard to say neither of these grew in culture, but he also received a number of antibiotics. Uh, but he did later on, again, grow enterobacter in his respiratory cultures. This was quite heavy growth. It was you know, consistently there for several days in his respiratory cultures. And you know, when he underwent bronchoscopy in the ICU, he really had findings that fit with a bacterial process at that point in time. So I would say that the you know, ventilator associated pneumonia was real, at least later in the hospital course. And this is one of his ICU chest x-rays from close to the end of his ICU stay. You can see it looks significantly worse than his admission chest x-ray. So ultimately, um, this individual developed multi-system organ failure with diffuse alveolar damage, ARDS. He could not be extubated. He had very profound respiratory acidosis. He also developed renal failure and had severe metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, minimal urine output, all of which fit with acute renal failure. He was not deemed to be a dialysis candidate. Um, he also was in shock for much of his hospital stay. He was initially started on norepinephrine post intubation. Um, but was intermittently on two pressors with vasopressin being the second presser and ultimately could never come off of pressor support in order to maintain his map at the ICU set goal. 
Um, and he succumbed to his illness on hospital day 23, which was approximately day 26 post symptom onset. So this particular individual was another one of our longitudinal donors. Um, his neutralizing antibody titers are in the green here. Uh, and we can see on days 10 and 15 post symptom onset, he did you know, have high neutralizing antibody titer levels. But what we're not showing here is that he had no detectable um, helper T cell responses at either time point, And he actually had no detectable cytotoxic or killer CD8 T cell responses at that latter time point. And so this is someone who had a partial immune response. And as the Dr. Motorbacher suggested, the, the T cell response might be more important uh, than the antibody response based on our cohort and what we saw. Uh, and so even though he has good neutralizing antibody titers, it uh, clearly was not enough to prevent him from succumbing to his COVID-19. So I, I think that you know, these are only two cases, but I do want to um, point out that you know, COVID-19 really is, um, it's a spectrum of disease severity. We see a myriad number of disease manifestations different outcomes. And so it's really hard to talk about COVID-19 as a single disease process. You know, it really should be, in my mind, spoken of as sort of a spectrum of uh, disease. And then uh, as Dr. Motorbacher really pointed out, the adaptive immune response to SARS-CoV-2 does play a role in determining the COVID-19 disease severity. And it doesn't appear that it's causing harm, but rather having a coordinated adaptive immune response um, appears to be protective against more severe disease. And then this is just my, my pitch for all the physician scientists who are out there. Um, this is an older photo of Dr. Fauci getting dressed up in his suit to go take care of some Ebola patients that were housed at the NIH at the time. And a quote that he said at the time that I thought was really powerful. I do believe that one gets unique insights into disease when you actually physically interact with patients. And so it was really a pleasure to be able to interact with all of these individuals who had COVID-19 in their families and to hear their stories and to be there to support them during these challenging times. And it really um, lends a personal perspective to the research that we're doing. And that's it as far as slides. If anyone has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. I do think um, Laura mentioned she had to jump off to another meeting at six o'clock. So I think um, it's sort of up to us to wrap it up. So um, if anyone else has a, a question this time for us that we can try and answer. I'm just peeking at the chat and um, I think if, anyone wants to reach out to us and send us questions. Uh, if the ATS group wants to funnel them to us via email, that's another option. And then my understanding is this recording will be available online. And so hopefully people who are not able to attend live because they're in other time zones will also have an opportunity to ask any questions that they might have after the fact. All right, yeah, um, thank you everyone. Um, it was great to get to share our work today. Um, and yeah, any other questions? Um, you can uh, be reached by email if you would really like to reach out to us. So thank you again. Thank you all. Have a good night.